Hi, welcome to the recording for the lecture on the somatic nervous system. My name is Dr. Alita Partasadarso, and I'll be walking you through these slides. So what we're going to cover here is we're going to cover three main areas. The first one is sensory receptors and how we classify them by either structure, function, uh, or by their location. Secondly, we're going to look at special senses, which includes vision, hearing, equilibrium, taste, and smell. And then lastly, we're going to look at the processing that occurs in the cerebral cortex. That's the gray matter that forms the sulci and gyri of the cerebral cortex. And we're going to look at <clears throat> the connections within the cerebrum and outside of the cerebrum. We're going to look at the homunculus, both sensory and motor, and we're going to look at um, ascending and descending somatic tracts. Let's begin. So when we think about sensory receptors, we know that we have a lot of them. So sensory receptors are activated by chain by stimuli caused by changes in either our internal or our external environment. Even when we're sitting down just relaxing, we're getting information through sensory receptors in our ears, in our eyes, when we're breathing in and out, there's sensory receptors um, within our lungs, when our heart is beating, again, sensory receptors within our heart, we when we're thinking or even not thinking, when we're watching TV, we've got a lot going on in our in our brain. There's uh, proprioceptors, which uh, which give us an indication of the location of our joints and muscles, and we've also got sensory receptors in our viscera, in our in our stomach, in our intestine, in our liver, and all that kind of stuff. So. There's a lot of information that goes on, um, even when we're asleep, when we're relaxing, and um, especially so when we're actively doing something. Sensory capability can become more acute as we mature, but as um, we age or as we get diseases or structural defects, they can also be affected. So just some basic definitions. So receptors are those structures within our body that detect sensations, that detect stimuli, and that can generate an action potential in neurons. Each receptor can only receive input from one type of stimulus or one sensory modality. So for example, very simple example, our ear can only receive and um, auditory information can only um, can only detect sound right if um, our ears can't detect sight right what comes into our eyes can't detect taste can't detect anything except for sound same with our eyes only goes through what enters into our eyes doesn't have anything to do with what we taste what we smell what we hear. So that's a sensory modality. The term sensation is the activation of those sensory receptor cells at the level of stimulus. So for example, when we hear a noise, that is a sensation, right? When, when um, a cold uh, drop of water falls on our skin, that's a sensation. And then perception is when our uh, brain and, and spinal cord process the stimuli into a meaningful pattern. So again, we know um, what a cold drop of water on our skin feels like because we felt it before, right? So again, if you look over here, you've got the receptors in our finger over here, and then they send their information up to the brain here and it gets processed and then it sends uh, information back down to our periphery. If we actually stuck our finger into a source of heat, heat, then the information from our brain down to our hands will tell our hands to move away from it, right? So this is the action over here. When we talk about receptor potential, it's basically the ability of something to potentially 
um, generate an action potential. So you know how we talked about excitatory postsynaptic potentials previously and inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So basically, whenever we um, whenever we feel a change or a stimulus. Um, that stimulus ha has to hit a certain threshold in order for us to actually respond. So, for example, if you look in this diagram, you've got this uh, person with a finger on a source of heat. And if that source of heat is, heat is hot enough, then the brain processing centers, uh, the central nervous system processing centers, will tell his hand to uh, jerk away. But if the, the, the heat isn't that much or if it's cold or if it's room temperature, then um, that, that jerk reflex won't be activated, right? So stimulus acts on the receptor, develops a graded response, an EPSP. If the EPSP is strong enough and reaches threshold, then an action potential starts. And once an action potential starts, it then... Um, sends a signal towards the central nervous system um, and then in the brain and this uh, that's where perception happens the sensation is felt and the re reflex response is started um, there is a principle of adaptation which is a functional characteristic of receptors so you see over here just a few uh, pictures over here. So the pictures um, right in the middle is a picture of four individuals. This one has a has a heavy backpack on his back. This uh, lady has sunglasses on the uh, uh, on the top of her head. Um, this person has um, an earring, dangly earring, hanging down from her ear. And then this um, little little guy is carrying uh, two boxes of heavy fruit. Right, so adaptation is whether or not the, um, the 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 receptors can actually um, uh, whether the the response decreases over time um, or not. Right, so if you talk about adaptation as being the decrease over time in response to a stimulus, what you have over here is if you look at what slowly adapting receptors do, um, you look at when the stimulus, so with this guy over here in A and this guy in B, once this person puts on the backpack or once this guy lifts these two heavy boxes of, uh, of fruit, that's when the stimulus goes on, right? And then as soon as the, the, the boy drops his boxes of fruit or as soon as the guy takes off his backpack, that's when the stimulus comes off. And what you can see here is when we look at the activity level of the receptor, you can see when the backpack gets put on, it goes up and then it plateaus down. But then you see that there's a plateau that remains until he takes off his backpack or he drops those boxes of, of fruit. This is an example of a slowly adapting receptor because this person A and this person B is always aware that they've got a backpack on his back or he's carrying two boxes of um, fruit. A rapidly adapting receptor is one that's indicated in the orange box where, say, um, the woman in one and this person in two, they put on their sunglasses at the top of, of their head or they put on earrings, right? And then at some point, earrings get taken off or the sunglasses get, uh, get, get taken off. And what you can see here in terms of the receptor potential is there's this big spike of awareness when you put the sunglasses on, on your head or when you put the earrings off and then the nerve kind of quiets down, right? So it rapidly adapts to the presence of the stimulus. And you know this because um, you know people, or you've done it yourself, where you're like, where are my sunglasses, right? Where are my sunnies? Because I don't feel them on the top of my head. Or, oh, am I wearing earrings? Right? So that's an example of a rapidly adapting uh, receptor where that sensation 
kind of wears off and you don't perceive it anymore um, until you actually take it off and then you, you say, oh, okay, I've actually taken, taken the sunnies off or I've taken the earrings off. So that's an example. Those are examples of rapidly adapting receptors. When we classify neurons, we can classify neurons based on their sensory endings. So again, their sensory endings are the parts that detect the stimulus. And so if you want to classify the neurons based on the location of the sensory endings, sensory endings are either located in the body, right? internally, often within uh, body organs, and these are called visceral or interval receptors, or they're located um, on or near the body surface, in which case they're called external receptors, or there's a special kind of visceral receptor called proprioceptors that, that um, get information from body movement, body position, orientation, and space. Right. So as the name suggests, visceroceptors or interoceptors um, collect information from what's happening inside the body, right, in the viscera. Extroreceptors collect information of what's happening outside of the body, the external environment, and proprioceptors collect information about body movement, body position, and orientation of our limbs and our body in space. So that's the classification of neurons by the location of the sensory endings. We can also classify neurons based on the structure of the sensory endings. So not by the structure of their axon, right? But by the structure of the ending that detects the stimulus. So the most common structure of sensory endings are free nerve endings. So you can see over here, these are free nerve endings. There are no specialized um, things at the end of the uh, um, um, dendrites. And so what happens is these dendrites just get embedded in tissue that receive the sensations, right? So the uh, uh, sensory receptors that include free nerve endings are visceral receptors, nociceptors that detect pain, Thermal receptors that detect temperature, mechanoreceptors that detect stretch or um, tension. The second kind of uh, structure of sensory nerve endings are encapsulated nerve endings. So what happens is you've got the dendrites inside and the dendrites are encapsulated or have got a capsule around it, right? And these are... Um, sensory nerve endings that detect touch, pressure, vibration, or stretch. The third type of um, structure for nerve endings are the specialized receptor cells that contains distinct structural components that interpret a specific type of stimulus, right? So this is the one that detects um, um, light. Um, there are others that detect smell, others that detect taste. So those are those specialized receptor cells. So over here, you've got the classification of sensory neurons and receptors based on location as well as on structure. This slide um, tells you about the sensory nerves um, if we classify it based on the stimulus it detects. So we've got Osmoreceptors, chemoreceptors, mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors, photoreceptors, and nociceptors. Osmoreceptors detect the osmotic concentration, right? So it detects the changes in concentration of electrolytes in extracellular fluid. And these osmoreceptors are found in the hypothalamus, which is the third center of the body, right? So it makes sense. So if your fluid level drops, your fluid level um, goes up, it's detected by, the, the, by these osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. Chemoreceptors, as the name suggests, detects um, 
the concentration of certain chemicals. So the type of chemoreceptors that exist throughout the body depends on where in the body um, it is. So for example, we've got chemoreceptors that detect the presence of carbon dioxide, other chemoreceptors that detect the presence or absence of glucose, the presence or absence of, say, sodium ions, um, different taste, different smell. Those are detected by chemoreceptors throughout the body. Some chemoreceptors also de can differentiate, can detect fat content or protein content um, and, and you can imagine that these exist within the digestive tract to actually detect what foods are in our digestive system. Mechanoreceptors detect mechanical stimuli. So again, they're found throughout the body um, and they are sensitive to stretch, to pressure, to the filling of hollow organs. So if you drink one liter of water, then there are mechanoreceptors in your stomach that detect your stomach filling up. Right? and it makes you full. The other uh, type of receptors is the thermoreceptors, so detect changes in temperature. And if you look over here, you can see that there is a set of uh, thermoreceptors that are sensitive to cold. There's another set of thermoreceptors that are sensitive to, to warm. Right? Photoreceptors only present in the eye, activated by light, and then we've got nociceptors. So nociceptors are present throughout the body. They're activated by intense stimuli or pain cessation that may damage tissue. So the nociceptors are, are stimulated in order to prevent damage, uh, permanent um, or further damage to tissue. So if you look again at the uh, um, graph on the top, you can see you've got the cold receptors over here, but you got nociceptors that, that detect pain when it's freezing and other nociceptors that detect pain when it's hot, right? So those nociceptors detect extremes, right? So again, someone tapping you on the, sh on the shoulder won't set off nociceptors. Someone punching you in the shoulder will activate those nociceptors, right? Because a punch is an intense pain compared to a tap. The next part of the uh, uh, lecture goes through the different sensations that we have. So the first one is gust gustation. Um, so gustation is the sense of taste. So what we have in our tongue is we have the presence of gustatory cells they detect presence of various chemicals. So you can see over here the various chemicals that they detect. So sodium ions, protons, glucose, alkaloid, um, and the uh, uh, amino acid glutamate that's found in protein-rich foods, right? So what happens is when we eat, when we put food or drinks in our mouth, what happens is we've got several different gustatory taste cells that um, are chemoreceptors and they detect um, various chemicals in the food or drink that we that we uh, um, eat um, and it releases a neurotransmitter you don't have to to uh, know which neurotransmitter is released and then what happens is that neurotransmitter then binds to the receptors on dendrites of sensory neurons on cranial nerves. So the cranial nerves that are involved in taste are the facial nerve, glossopharyngeal, and the vagus nerves. Next sensation is uh, smelling or, or olfaction. And so the tissue that's, re, um, that's involved in the um, sense of smell are the olfactory epithelium. So again, what happens is they're found in the nose, as you can see here, the olfactory uh, epithelium. Um, they uh, contain these olfactory sensory neurons. So what happens is you have a cup of coffee over here. The odor of coffee wafts into your nose into the olfactory epithelium um, and gets dissolved into mucus. And then what happens is then uh, the um, particles of odor, the odorant molecules binds to proteins to keep them dissolved into mucus. 
and then it's transported to the olfactory dendrites right over here, right? So this is the path of the inhaled air. That's the mucus. So it's transferred over to the dendrite where it binds to a G protein coupled receptor on, a, uh, on an, an olfactory neuron to actually um, send its signal via the olfactory tract. Remember, a tract is a bunch of, of uh, axons that are traveling in the same direction. And this olfactory tract then projects to the frontal lobe. Right? And once it goes into the frontal lobe, then it gets split into the cerebrum where you have the primary olfactory cortex and then the limbic system, which is involved in the emotional response and the hypothalamus, which is involved in long-term memory. So again, that's why if you smell some, something out of the blue, it, brings, it, it can bring back a, a specific memory right, because a sense of smell is linked together with an emotional response and long-term memory. Next sense is the sense of hearing or audition. So again, sound enters into the external, in through the external ear, goes in through the middle ear, and when it's in the external ear, it's directed towards the uh, ear or auditory canal over here. Um, and what happens is the tympanic membrane over here is vibrated um, based on the uh, sound. Um, and then what happens is then it, uh, it connects up um, to the pharynx via the eustachian tube over here. Um, and then it gets turned into a neural signal, which then travels through another of the cranial nerves. Next sense is the sense of balance or equilibrium. Um, and again, the inner ear is responsible for that. So this is the inner ear over here. Um, and the equilibrium is uh, um, receives input about head position, head movement, body motion, and it's detected by these uh, mechano, me mechano receptors in the vestibule of the inner ear. So this is the vestibule of the inner ear. And what, what it has over here is it has this mechanoreceptors consisting of these um, stereo cilia and support cells in the macula. So you've got the macula over here, and then you've got the uh, um, stereo cilia, right? And so what happens is the stereo cilia extend into the autolithic membrane, and you've got these autoliths which is basically calcium uh, crystals that sit on top of it that make this membrane top heavy. And then as we tilt, so if you look over here, as we tilt our head forward, this also tilts forward and then the force of gravity then bends these hair cells. And so it gives you that sense of equilibrium, right? And again, equilibrium, um, sense of equilibrium is sent to the brainstem and cerebellum via the vestibulocochlear nerve, which is uh, cranial nerve number eight. And then the, the uh, next um, special sense is that of vision. Again, vision comes through the eyes. Um, there are six extraocular muscles. So extraocular muscles are muscles that are outside of the eye um, that originate from the orbital bones and insert into the surface of the eyeball. So you've got the six um, uh, over here. Um, and you can see here, you've got superior rectus. If that's contracted, it pulls the eye up right? Inferior rector, rectus pulls the eye straight down. Medial rectus, if it contracts, pull the, the eye towards the nose. Lateral rectus pulls the eye towards, on, towards the side, um, towards the ears. Um, there are four cranial nerves that are involved in vision. The first one is the optic nerve, which is the one involved in the actual seeing. And then the other three are the nerves that control the eye muscles, 
right? So you've got the ocular motor nerve, the trochlear nerve, the adductions uh, um, uh, nerve. And all these three motor nerves help to control the uh, movement of the um, eye muscles and, and therefore the movement of the eye. So you can, you can uh, move um, where you actually uh, focus your vision on. Third thing we're going to cover today is the processing that happens in the cerebral cortex. And what you can see here is you got the cerebral cortex with um, uh, the different lobes within the cerebrum. And what you can see here is that different areas are involved in either receiving or sending different types of information, right? So you've got the motor areas, right you've got the and you've got the brocus area in the prefrontal cortex um, the brocus area is involved in production of human uh, language and then you've got the wernicke's area that is involved in understanding human language one thing i i wanted to to um, bring to your attention is you've got this um, you've got primary something cortex and then it's right close to the something association contract cortex area sorry so you see over here um you've got the oops you've got the primary visual cortex right next to the visual association area and then you've got the primary auditory cortex right next to the auditory association area. You've got the um, primary somatosensory cortex next to the sensory association area. So what I wanted to tell you is this. When you have the primary cortex, that is the one that receives the unfiltered information. So your primary visual cortex receives input from your eyes. But what happens is for you to actually make sense of what you're seeing, you need to actually associate it with something, with a memory, right? So that's where the associ association area comes in. So if um, the first time you meet, say, first time you meet me, you don't know who I am. But what you do is your eyes see me and you see me visually. Um, and, and then what happens is when I introduce myself, you're like, oh, okay, you're my professor. And then what happens is you put that information into your visual association area. So that next time you see me, what happens is your eyes taking that input of me and then your visual association area says, oh, that's my A&P prof, right? Same with um, sound. So when you hear a dog barking, imagine if you've never heard a dog barking before, you hear a dog barking, that's what you hear. And then you have, um, the second time you hear a dog barking, you're like, oh, I've heard that sound before because I've got this memory of a dog barking in my association area. Right, so that's the difference between the primary cortex of whatever, as well as the association area of the same whatever, if that makes sense. All right, when we look at tracks, tracks are myelinated axons within the central nervous system. What we see is that we've got different kinds of tracks that help um, connect different parts of the uh, cerebral cortex, right? Um, and so what we have is we have three different tracks within the cerebral cortex. The first one are the association tracks. The association tracks um, connect one um, convolution to the next within the same hemisphere, right? So this is either in the left or right hemisphere, these are association tracks over here. And then you've got commissural tracks, also known as the corpus callosum, that help to connect the right hemisphere 
to the left hemisphere. So these are commissural tracts over here. And then thirdly, you've got projection tracts. And projection tracts um, connect the cerebrum to other parts of the nervous system. So projection tracts over here start in the cerebrum and go to other parts of the nervous system, both peripheral and central nervous system. So you've got these three kinds of tracts and then the connectome is the en entire network of neural connections in the brain, right? So you've got association tracts, which are the most numerous um, and, and association tracts um, can be similar to like you whispering to your neighbor sitting on the other side of you. Commissural tracts is you shouting to um, a person on the other side of the room. And then projection tracts is you texting someone somewhere else in the world. Ascending somatic sensory pathway in the central nervous system. So somatic has to do with your body, right? So if you look at the somatosensory stimuli, it involves um, sensation to do with touch, temperature, pain, and body position, right? Ascending means it comes from the periphery and goes up to the central nervous system, right? And what happens over here is you have three um, steps of neuron. The first step of neuron is the first order neuron, and these are the ones that actually um, detect the different sensations. So touch, temperature, pain, proprioceptions in our periphery or on, um, on our skin or different parts of our body. So that comes up through the first order neuron, which then um, go to um, through the spinal cord um, and end either in the spinal cord or the brainstem, right? It, um, so they end in the spinal cord or the brainstem. And then the, um, the ones that end in the uh, um, spinal cord, um, they will start at the spine and travel up to the thalamus. So these guys that start at the spinal cord and travel up to the thalamus are called spinothalamic tract, right? They start at the spinal cord, travel up to the thalamus. And then in the thalamus, because the thalamus is a processing relay station, then what happens is they connect up with a third neuron, which is called the third order neuron. And these third neuron projects start at the thalamus and go up to the cortex. So if you look at the name of the third order sensory neurons, start at the th thalamus, project up to the cortex. So they're called thalamocortical tracts, right? And when it goes to the cortex in the postcentral gyrus, that's when conscious perception occurs, right? This seems to be a long-winded process, but really, if you if you accidentally put your finger on a hot stove, your brain will sense it um, sooner than you realize, right? So you've got these um, ascending somatic sensory pathways in the uh, central nervous system. When we look at the somatic areas within the cerebral cortex itself, um, we've seen this before. We've got these... Um, these um, homunculus, right? And this is, uh, I mean, these are very, very funny looking um, people over here. But what happens over here is that the size of the body part indicates how much, um, how much input they have um, to it. So the sensory homunculus here, you can see the size of the hand is very large compared to to the size of the arm. And that's because your hands are very, very sensitive to different stimulus, right? You can see here the size of the jaw and the mouth and the tongue is very large as well. Um, and that's because we receive a lot of input from our mouth, jaw, tongue, um, 
lips, and so on, right? So what happens is all these input from different parts of the body go up to the primary somatosensory cortex and look at what's right next to it. The area that's right next to the primary somatosensory cortex is called the sensory association area. So again, if you touch a mouse the first time, you don't know what it is. You touch it a second time, you've got a memory in the sensory association area telling you that it's a mouse. Um, again, on the left-hand side, you've got the motor homunculus. So again, the size of the body part indicates how much um, control or how much movement you have to that specific body part. So if you look at this, your hands are huge compared to your arms, right, or even your legs, um, and your mouth and jaw and nose is uh, also huge. So this um, motor homunculus is housed within the primary motor uh, cortex over here, which is um, also called the pre-central uh, gyrus because it's right after the central sulcus over here. Um, and what happens is these neurons over here project down to different parts of the body to send information to stimulate individual uh, muscles. Right, so um, you've got that, and you've got the premotor um, area, which helps to activate groups of muscles simultaneously for controlled movement. So, for example, if you want to pick up a pencil, you don't just activate the muscles in your fingers. You might have to reach out your hand in order to get to the pencil in order to pick it up, and so that involves a coordinated movement for controlled and uh, and smooth movement. So this is information going up to the cerebral cortex into the, the um, post-central gyrus to the primary somatosensory uh, cortex and then it gets processed there, sends information to the um, pre-central gyrus to send movement information back down to the different body parts. So the way that it sends um, information back down to the various body parts is through these descending somatic motor pathways. And over here, there are two different, um, two sequential motor neurons that are involved in sending um, signals back to down to individual muscles, um, skeletal muscles in our body. So the first one starts in the precentral gyrus of the cerebral cortex, goes all the way down um, to, through the brainstem, um, and it might, it might go to the other side or decussate um, to the other si side at the pyramids of the, of the brainstem, and, um, and then it synapses um, in the anterior horn, so in the gray part at the front of the spinal cord, where it um, synapses with the lower motor neuron. So the lower motor neuron starts at the spinal cord, and then it goes to the skeletal muscle. So you have one motor neuron, um, the first motor neuron, which is the upper motor neuron from the CNS all the way down to the spinal cord. And then the second motor neuron is called the lower motor neuron, starts in the spinal cord and sends a signal to the skeletal muscle. And then once it reaches the skeletal muscle, then you have conscious or voluntary movement of the skeletal muscle. Um, as we, I talked about in a previous lecture, we have got a um, uh, little bumps in our spinal cord at the C5 to T1 region called the cervical environment uh, enlargement which helps to innervate our upper limbs and then another one down in the lumbar region called the lumbar enlargement which helps to innervate our lower limb right the cervical enlargement is larger than the lumbar one uh, enlargement because our our upper limbs our hands have more fine motor control, and so it has more nerves to actually control our, to, to give 
more control and more fine motor control to our hands and our fingers. And on that note, I'm going to end it now. Thank you.